Welcome to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad to sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and you guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They will certainly uh, that I came from you and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, for who those who have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. <clears throat> By that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture will be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you to protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Thanks be to God. I've been busily checking the uh, Kids Talk roster to work out when I'm on next. We can settle a few accounts. Well, I actually, it is really good when there is a great Kids Talk. We have a big discussion about this during the week as a staff team. Uh, and uh, it's kind of scary to get up and preach after a really good Kids Talk. I kind of feel like we've, we've pretty much covered it. But um, uh, no, we, we, we'll see what else we can find in God's Word. Um, but I wonder, have you ever felt underqualified? Underqualified for a particular role or task or job? I remember my time as a young instrument fitter, an apprentice. I was, uh, I was sent by my boss to a recycled oil refinery. Uh, that was being, it was brand new, it was, being, it was under construction and my job uh, was to unbox and install all the instruments that were going to be used at that refinery. Uh, all these devices that told the control room, you know, things like how much gas is flowing, flowing through a pipe, high pressure, highly explosive gas. Uh, or how much of this highly corrosive toxic chemical was in a tank or how hot, how many hundreds of degrees Celsius was the distillation tower which contained highly flammable petrochemicals. Uh, and I hadn't even finished my apprenticeship. Uh, and my trainer, the actual tradesman, had left the company months earlier. And I think my boss thought, uh, hey, we can just make some good money on a, just send this guy out on his apprentice wage and get the job done. 
I wonder if we feel that way as a Christian sometimes, especially when we uh, talk uh, about seeking and reaching non-Christians and telling them about Jesus. Do you feel underqualified? Perhaps uh, worried that if you did say something, you'll say the wrong thing. Uh, And while you might not blow up a recycled oil refinery, you might be worried that you could, I don't know, turn someone off Jesus. Or, Or you might mislead them or just generally make a muppet of yourself. Last week, Paul Hallam, I always have to say Hallam now in case you confuse him with the Apostle Paul, which happens, um, Paul asked the question of why God doesn't just take the disciples out of the hostile world. Why doesn't he just beam them up out of trouble? And the answer to that uh, was that, the answer was that Jesus has a job for them to do. Jesus, after all he has done is, and is about to do on the cross, he's about to, to, to leave and hand over his mission to these disciples of his. He will send them to take his message to the whole world. That's why he doesn't take them out of the world. However, it raises perhaps a harder question for us, is really, why them? I mean, why hand this monumentally important mission over to them? Why hand the fate of the salvation of the world over to a rabble of unlikely nobodies? These disciples include Simon the Zealot uh, and Matthew the tax collector. Have you ever thought about this? Is Simon the Zealot is basically a Jewish jihadist and Matthew the tax collector is, is basically a Jewish traitor. Uh, they don't strike me as ideal co-workers. Uh, And then you have Peter, who's always speaking before he thinks. Then you have James and John, who we saw when we looked at Matthew a little while ago, who thought they were better than everybody else on the team. You know, they should be second and third in charge. This is not my first pick for Jesus' marketing team. They are weak and underqualified. But it turns out it is no accident that these guys are the ones that Jesus will send. In fact, they are the ones that God has specifically given to Jesus. Jesus has come into the world and revealed himself to them through his teaching uh, and his miracles uh, and his words. Uh, Jesus said in his prayer that uh, I gave them the words that you gave me. He says that they have accepted this Uh, this message, this gospel, uh, and they know that he has come from them, that he has come from God, that he has sent him. They've believed him. They know he is sent from God. That's it. That's their qualifications. They've been given by the Father to the Son. Later they will be given the Holy Spirit and uh, to lead them into all truth. This unlikely rabble of nobodies has been given everything. As Jesus prayed for God to protect them, uh, Jesus also prayed for God to protect them, protect them so that they'll be uh, united. Uh, He says, you know, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus asked the Father to give them together a continuing trust in his name, That is a trust in him as the source of their salvation, not in anything or anyone that might distinguish them from, from, uh, you know, above one another. Their unity comes from their connection, their common source of salvation. And likewise, Jesus asks his Father to protect them from uh, from the evil one. Oh, sorry, to protect them from the evil one and not take them out of the world. Uh, Protect them from anything Satan will do to take their faith away. The point I want us to notice here is that these guys are certainly underqualified. There is no good reason for them in themselves to be the ones that take Jesus' mission to the world. But what we see as a fault is actually a feature. Because all that they need... 
All that they have has been given to them from God. All their security and perseverance come from God through the message that they have received and the power of God that they have seen and believed. And this weak and underqualified rabble actually brings glory to Jesus. Glory has come to me through them, he says. Again, these disciples, they've not done anything spectacular in themselves except except to be drawn out of the world and given to Jesus by the Father to receive and accept the truth about Jesus. Their weakness and underqualification is a feature, not a fault. It's something we begin to get a glimpse of later on in the book of Acts where we see Peter and John arrested for speaking about Jesus in the temple. Uh, and you see this happen. when they, that This is the temple authorities. When they see the courage, they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realise that they were what? underqualified, unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. These unschooled, ordinary men had nothing remarkable about them. But what was remarkable was that they had been with Jesus. That's what was noted. The glory is beginning to come to Jesus and it will continue until the last day, when at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I find some of this comfort, I find this a bit comforting. It's comforting knowing that these guys are underqualified. They are ordinary, flawed human beings like us. That's something that we can relate to. But being relatable... That's good. It's never enough. I mean, imagine being interviewed for a job that you were hopelessly underqualified for. I don't know if you've been in that situation. I have. <laughs> I tell you what, I just tried to make up stuff on the spot. But charm and relatability will only get you so far. At some stage, you need to show your resume, your actual qualifications. And look, even if you got the job, how long until you were found out? that you have no right to be there, no actual qualifications. Now, perhaps that's something that presses in on us from time to time, that we're not qualified to speak about Jesus to others, that we're too ordinary, or, or, or worse, we're plain frauds. Surely, so did the disciples have these sorts of, of worries. These disciples will need a qualification to speak in Jesus' name. They can't fake it until they make it. They need something else that truly qualifies them. And so Jesus prays that God would sanctify them. There's a funny word that we don't use so often, sanctify, sanctification. Maybe, you know, you might use it as a jibe at someone. Oh, you know, you're so sanctimonious. <laughs> Maybe getting towards the, the meaning of it. But it's a word we don't say often. Maybe we sing it in, a, in some of our songs. It simply means set apart. Uh, for special use, God's special use. And God will do that by setting them apart through the truth. He says in verse 17, and we praise, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. He's asking his Father to immerse them uh, in, the, in the truth about him. It's something that he has already mentioned before in the chapter earlier on. He said, uh, when the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all truth. This is what God is going to do for them. But also Jesus reveals in his prayer that he will sanctify himself for them. Right at the very end of, that, of what we read today. For I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus has set himself apart for God's special purpose. And that purpose is to go to the cross. He will set himself apart for the special work of dying for them. Of dying for their sins to make them clean and holy and forgiven. To make them totally, completely acceptable to God. And therefore, worthy, qualified to be sent into the world to rightly speak in his name. And finally, they have the qualification of not only what God has 
has made them, sanctified them for, done for them, but of what they were. Have a think about this. In the prayer, we see all this in and, and out of the world, uh, you know, in and out and, and of the world language. We heard in verse 6 that they were, uh, they were given from out of the world to Jesus. You know, they're from the world, or they were taken out of the world, given to Jesus. And yet in verse 11, they are still physically in the jelly, sorry, in the world. They are still physically in the world. But in verse 14, Jesus says, they are not of the world. They don't belong to it anymore. They are distinct and, and, and separate. And yet in verse 15, Jesus' his prayer is not to take them physically out of the world, but to protect them. And finally in verse 18, as, as Jesus was sent into the world, he is sending them into the world. The point I want us to see is that these guys are local. They know this world. They've been set apart from it. They no longer belong to it. But the world is not a strange place to them, nor are they strange to it. They are sent to their own. The people they once belonged to. The Apostle Paul, not Paul Hallam, the Apostle Paul points out this to the church in Ephesus. Now, all of us, he says, all of us also lived among them at one time. That's among the world, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. We were in and of the world. But Paul goes on to point out how this Reality, again, gives glory to God as it points to the great work that he has done in us through Jesus because of his great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. These disciples are exactly the people to take forward the message and the mission of Jesus. They are not frauds. They are not fakers. They are the real deal. Real people from the world that God has really saved and is sending into that world. I think this prayer of Jesus reveals to us some of the heart of Jesus and the heart of God, his Father. We saw it as we read Psalm 67 uh, earlier today, a psalm which Israel sung at harvest time in thanksgiving to God. He is the God that provides the harvest for his people year after year after year. But in that psalm, right at the centre of it, the heart of God's plan through his people was always to reach the whole world. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. Not just Israel, the nations. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. God's desire is for all people to come under his rule and blessing. All the nations of the earth to be sanctified, united in the truth, obedient in the faith. And that desire comes out here in Jesus' prayer, that the world would come to know Jesus. In fact, it's made explicit in the part of the prayer we're going to look at next week, when the world would know, Jesus prays that the world would know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now, as Paul Hallam pointed out last week, Jesus is praying here for his disciples, uh, his band of apprentices, the ordinary, everyday, unremarkable blokes that have been following him around. Certainly people with an extraordinary place in history. I could have had an extraordinary place in history if the refinery had blown up. Fortunately, it didn't. Uh, but these people did extraordinary things. No one can doubt that. You read the book of Acts and you will see that. They did extraordinary things, and yet none of it was because they themselves were special or remarkable, but all of it was because of what God has done for them through Jesus, through the Spirit, through His work in the world. And the remarkable thing is, all that He has done for these disciples... He has also done for each and every Christian in the room here today. Every one of you who knows 
Jesus as Lord, who knows he is the one sent by God, who has put their trust in him, who has the Holy Spirit. He has done all of these things for you too. Each and every Christian in this room is about as ordinary and unremarkable as these guys were. Sorry, it's just the way it is. Yet the qualifications Jesus gave them to speak and serve in his name, they all appear on your resume too. You yourself have received the glorious revelation of the Son of God. You yourself know that he was sent by God to save. You yourself have received the Spirit which sanctifies. You yourself were once of this world, but now you are not of this world. You have been forgiven and sanctified by his work on the cross. You are highly qualified. And you yourself are sent into this world. This prayer of Jesus would, should surely shape our prayers and our life. As we, through this prayer, be, are able to look into Jesus' heart, it's got to affect ours. We've heard his heart, we've heard his desires for his people, his desire for the world. We have also learnt that we are qualified and sent into the world. Now, I'm not saying that each one of us are capital E evangelists. You're going to go out and, uh, and stand on the street corner there and, and, and hold out your Bible and, and, and shout at passers-by and everyone's going to go, wow, listen to that. I mean, some of you might. But that's not everybody, clearly. Not everyone will have the confidence to speak fluently of the gospel. But we have learned that God does desire and give each one of us what we need. I mean, everything that makes us up as Christians, God has given us. He will give us what we need to be the people that he sends into the world, to be the people that he sends into the workplace, into our own homes, our families, sporting clubs, schools, TAFE or unis. The confidence is not in ourselves in what he has given us. And we have the prayer that we have seen today that models and shapes the prayers that we can say. We can say, Lord, help me. Because weakness is a feature, not a fault. God knows that we are weak, that we need his help. He desires that we cry out to him, asking for that help. He knows that our weakness is something that he will use for his glory. We can pray, Lord, sanctify me. Set me apart. Help me to learn and know the truth about Jesus. Sanctify me by the truth. And send me your spirit. Guide me by your spirit in this truth. We can pray, Lord, protect me from the evil one. He knows that we will face a hostile world and that Satan stands against us. But he is stronger and has overcome the world. And we can pray, Lord, send me. Because he qualifies you. You are exactly the person that he has prepared to reach this world. And we can pray, Lord, save them. Because he sends us into the world so that the world might know Jesus too. One of the things that our, um, our Archbishop Kanishka Raphael has, uh, has put out for us uh, in the last little while is a, a call for us, an encouragement for us to commit to missional prayer. Uh, that just means to pray for people to become Christians to pray for the people that you know. Uh, And uh, he gives us a very practical idea, and and hopefully we'll um, pop this on one of our uh, church-wide emails or maybe put it on our Facebook page. But uh, feel free to take a photo of the screen if that's helpful. People were doing that before. But it's an encouragement to pray practically for the people that you see around you, that you encounter or, or engage with in some way, and gives it some sort of basic structure. It might be... 
praying for a family member one day, uh, a friend, someone that you see at work or school or, or TAFE or uni, someone that, that you bump into regularly, that you have, that you have a, a friendship with. Uh, or maybe that person that is just an acquaintance, uh, someone that you, that you kind of brush by, but it helps us turn our mind and our hearts towards that person and to pray for them. Maybe that distant friend that you haven't caught up with in a long time, but you still feel that you know them and wonder how they're going. And maybe that wanderer, it could be someone that you... Uh, that someone that you know has been involved or, or known the Christian faith and has walked away or wandered away. And there are many other structures and many other things that we can do. But it comes down to us knowing the God that has called us, the God that has equipped us, the God that knows us. And knowing Him, the one who gives us our qualification who sanctifies us, who's, who sanctified himself so that we might be the ones that are qualified to speak in his name and take his mission forward in the world. Let's pray for those things now. Father God, help us, we pray. Help us in our weakness to bring glory to you. Lord, Sanctify us, help us to know, to be immersed in the truth about Jesus and set apart from this world and guided by your Spirit. Lord, protect us as we face a hostile work place or family or friendship group, a world that doesn't know and doesn't like Jesus. Protect us and Lord, send us. Thank you that you have qualified us as people who are righteous in your sight and free uh, of the condemnation of sin, that we can speak in your name. And Lord, we pray for those around us, those we know, uh, even those we vaguely know, that you would save, that you would rain upon them your spirit and give us the opportunity to speak the message of the gospel into their lives. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, get further information, or download other resources, please visit our website at lmap.org.au.